All right, good afternoon. I'm Randy Turner. I'm with the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, and this is the Accessibility and Disability Policy Webinar Series. Today we have with us Dawn Skaggs, who is the National Director of Whole Community Planning and Training with VCFS Health and Human Services Emergency Management Division. Um, she will be talking to us about inclusive emergency planning and personal preparedness. So Dawn, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, I am going to begin with a extremely brief um, explanation of, of why I'm here. Uh, BCFS Health and Human Services has an emergency management division of which I'm a part and one of the great things that we do is um, we have the opportunity to not only do policy procedures um, and practices consultation but we are having we have the opportunity to go out in the field um, and act as responders and so some of the information that you're going to see comes from our experience both in the uh, training component as well as planning and uh, response and to put all of the ideas of personal preparedness and where it fits into context I wanted to start with a little bit of the history um, of where we have been and what's happened and how things have come to be where they are today so we're going to start with the history and lessons learned how those impact people with disabilities um, in disasters in particular, and some of the planning and responses that have happened as a result. So to begin with, we're going to talk about our changing communities. Our communities, our plans need to reflect our communities and our communities are constantly changing. And most recently, we've had a lot of changes in the community specifically um, and related to personal preparedness. There's an ever increasing number of individuals living independently in the community who in the previous time may have been institutionalized or in group homes and are now living at home in their personal home, either with personal assistance services, medical support or skilled nursing in the home or any other number of um, accessibility accommodations. One in 10 individuals in our communities have a medical condition that could cause a major limitation in activity. In addition, one in every two Americans have a chronic condition that could become a disabling condition in a disaster. So this increasing population is really significant when we're talking about emergency planning. The other um, area that is ever increasing are the number of seniors. 50% uh, of the people living in a community who are over 65 have one disability. And I'm here to say that uh, 65 is not um, very old anymore like it used to be. Uh, many people of that same age bracket have two disabling conditions. An estimated 6.6 .6 million people who are over 65, will, there will be 6.6 .6 million people by 2020. So this is another huge and growing population group uh, we like to refer to as the silver tsunami. Um, in addition, there are more and more veterans who are returning um, who have visible or invisible disabilities. This is a population group that may or may not self-report as individuals with a disability, but need to be accounted for and planned with. Um, in addition, our, all of our communities are becoming increasingly culturally diverse. And when you combine all of these social components to the frequency and magnitude changes of disasters, um, we have a, a very significant opportunity to really look at how we're planning for people. We have a lot of disasters um, that are impacting individuals because people are living in disaster prone areas where they may not have been before. Um, we are constantly developing previously undeveloped areas. There's climate change increasing the cycles of fire, mudslide and flood in many areas of the country. And there's a rising cost for disaster response and recovery. So the more investment we can put into emergency inclusive planning, the less, the more we can impact these issues and the less cleanup we have to do and support of individuals after a disaster happens. Looking at where we've been and how we got here, uh, going back not all the way, but a lot of the way to Katrina was the first opportunity we had to really see that the impact of people with disabilities as a 
as it relates to the general population. People with disabilities comprise 25 to 30% of those people impacted by Hurricane Katrina. And although there was less than 12% of the population at the time who were over 75, 50% of the fatalities from that disaster were from the population group over 75. So it was disproportionate impact uh, undoubtedly. Of the people from Katrina who did not evacuate because they reported that they were unable to evacuate independently, 35% of them um, comprised the people who had fatalities. Of those who did evacuate, um, there was a study done in Houston um, for the Hurricane Katrina evacuees. And they, they demonstrated that 43% of those people had regular medications that they needed to take. 29% of those had a difficulty or inability to fill those prescriptions. So when we're talking about individuals with a disability who need evacuations, we, had a, we discovered we had a long ways to go. We fast forward a little bit into Superstorm Sandy, where we had more lessons learned and discovered that people with disabilities continue to remain in their homes for fear of not being able to be accommodated in the shelter settings. Um, while in other cases, individuals with disabilities were turned away as a result of the shelters not being able to support them. So some of those fears were justified as the stories came out and people realized that it was not necessarily clear to them whether they should or should not evacuate um, and, and go to a shelter from their homes where they already had facilities. Um, the other lessons we learned in Her Her Superstorm Sandy were that people were evacuated without their medical equipment on occasion and adding to their needs and dependence on others. There were multiple deaths that resulted from loss of power for individuals who were dependent on electricity. So we learned a great many lessons in those two disasters, following which in 2017 and 2018, we had the trilogy of Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, and Hurricane Maria. Um, and although we learned a great many lessons already, there were still several lessons to be learned and several things that were noted as outstanding. Many people with a disability were unable to navigate the system of supports that were set up by public agencies. Um, a lot of the forms were complex and inaccessible, and many people were not able to access the services at all due to not being in the shelter scenario or not having transportation to the services in order to participate adequately. There was a lack of information and a lack of information provided in accessible and redundant formats. There was uh, problems with home repair and participating in the system in order to get accessibility modifications done to homes um, because of some of the requirements for the FEMA and other uh, support services. We saw a lot of individuals who were separated from their natural supports, um, from their durable medical equipment, from their personal assistance services, both formal and informal, and from their source of medication. Additionally, and something that was not specifically identified in previous disasters, there was a realization that there was a significant lack of mental health accommodations both for individuals who had a mental health disability prior to the disaster, as well as those who had a disaster-related medical mental health um, need. So there was all of these considerations, as well as the realization that there was a significant lack of understanding of the government's role and what were the responsibilities of individuals and what was the responsibility of local jurisdictions or state or federal sources. Um, for the general population of individuals living in a community, this was very, very confusing. Beyond these specific uh, disaster related, there's been a number of additional lessons learned, some of which are uh, as follows. We've learned that there can be, that voluntary organizations and community-based organizations are often not integrated into the planning efforts. So some of the community capacity is really not utilized in its most efficient way. Other times when voluntary organizations are included in the planning, it's a, there is a tendency by 
public agencies to default to the private organization and allow them to do what really should be a collaborative effort. Um, simultaneously, there was an observance that services overlap and are duplicated, other services are underutilized, and there isn't a thorough comprehensive means to collaborate on services. Nonprofit, private sector, and adv advocacy groups and faith-based community have a huge capacity in our communities, but there's a gap between utilization of them and the communication and how they can utilize their resources. What is the appropriate and most effective way for them to be a partner in the planning response and recovery efforts? Emergency managers often don't anticipate how to best utilize these resources within their jurisdictions, resources that are functioning daily on an ongoing basis. Um, they may not know how to utilize them and they may even just not even know that they're there. Individuals in the community know what's best for them. We all know what our needs are and how best to meet our needs. But that process of communicating how that should work and how that should look in any given community remained a little bit ambiguous. So one of the strategies that has been put in place to address all of these lessons learned over time is of course the creation of new laws. On your screen, you'll see a list of some of the laws, not an exhaustive list, but some that are related to individuals, disasters, and individuals with disability in disasters. Of course, the, most, the law that we are all most familiar with is the Americans with Disabilities Act. In addition to that, there is the Fair Housing Act, Architectural Barriers Act, the Stafford Act, the Rehabilitation Act, and the Assistive Technology Act and most recently, the Post-Katrina Emergency Reform Act. Um, I have been a part of conversations where it's entirely possible we will be adding more acts to these um, and more laws. Laws are a great starting point, but they are not the answer. FEMA realized that um, after Hurricane Katrina and developed some guidance documents. In 2010, the first guidance document specifically related to disabilities and access and functional needs was developed. And that was the guidance on planning for integration of functional needs support services in general population shelters. It is partially a misnomer um, in the, the nomenclature of this guidance because the guidance is not just related to shelters. Guidance for inclusion of people with disabilities and provision of functional needs support services is really relevant to all phases of a disaster. Um, functional need support services uh, may be a new term for some of you, um, but it's not the, the concepts are not new. It is the guidance that allows individuals, uh, jurisdictions to ensure that they are providing um, the services that are required for individuals. That could be durable medical equipment, consumable medical supplies, personal assistant services, skilled professional services, assistive communication devices, um, interpretive services, um, alternative communication methods, uh, signage, structure for physical accessibility, transportation, and many, many others. That was a great start. The second guidance that was put out um, by FEMA came the year after that in 2011. And that was a whole community approach to emergency management principles, themes, and pathways for action. This guidance really identified that yes, public agencies need to provide the functional support services when necessary, but that was not sufficient. That there really needed to be an integrated collaborative effort in all phases of the disaster. So, the whole community approach really provided three fundamental principles, which uh, we will touch on in just a moment. Functional need support services, I'm gonna backtrack to that just a little bit because the definition for um, FEMA of that term is the services that enable children with adults, children and adults, sorry, without or with disabilities, to maintain their usual level of independence during a disaster. So this was very clearly not to allow or enable the jurisdictions to take over the planning, 
or be responsible for individual preparedness, but to do whatever was required to allow an individual to maintain the level of independence that they were used to prior to the disaster. And the full definition beyond that really outlines um, that it includes assistance, accommodation, or modification for mobility, communication, transportation, safety, health maintenance, or other needs for assistance accommodation due to any situation that limits an individual's ability to take action in an emergency. And that's really critical to what we're going to talk about in a moment. By applying the functional needs strategy to planning response and recovery, uh, jurisdictions were able to really look at what were the needs that were necessary for individuals in a disaster. And we can go on to the next slide. What are the functional needs? Next slide, please. Thank you. And how do we address those functional needs in a way that most enables people to retain their independence? Um, so the functional needs, and some of you may be familiar with the CMIS functional needs, that's the acronym for communication, maintaining health, independence, safety and support, and transportation. Um, this came from the disability community and was adopted by FEMA as a best practice. And what you'll see is for communication, they identified that public information and notification, early warning systems that are effective, face-to-face -face communication and assistive technology, all fell within the realm and responsibility of the jurisdiction. For maintaining health, providing consumer medical supplies, access to medical services and mental health supports were within the responsibilities of the jurisdiction. To ensure the maximum level of independence possible, I, again, the jurisdiction was tasked with provision of medical equipment, services, addressing service animals in an appropriate way, providing and accommodating for the personal assistance services and the need for that when necessary and recovery of individuals to their pre-disaster state of function. For safety and support, the jurisdiction identified that they are responsible for ensuring the safety um, and well-being of children and individuals with cognitive or intellectual disability, disabilities or others that required some additional support to ensure their safety. Um, they were responsible for personal assistive devices and for the provision of mass care services that included individuals with a disability whenever possible and appropriate. For transportation, the jurisdiction needs to provide accessible vehicles, retain the durable medical equipment and personal assistance services, service animals um, whenever, whenever they are provided or presented with an individual with a disability, and provide assistance loading and unloading of assistive technology. In order to do all of that, they, need, they realized they needed to address a whole community inclusive planning strategy. Next slide. So what is a whole community inclusive planning strategy? That is really looking at who is in the community. What are the needs, assets, and unique identifiers of any given community? A community may be a community of place, which is what we often think of when we think of community. It may also be a community of belief, of interest, purpose, circumstance, or any other identifier that groups an individuals, individuals together that allows them to have a sense of connection. Communities can exist geographically or virtually, and they can exist simultaneously and overlap. When you think about a community, you probably identify that you are part of several different kinds of communities. Communities can be unique and they will differ and their community need will differ based on their community type and within the community type, those needs will also differ. So realizing that there are a variety of different types of communities, let's identify what is whole community inclusion. Um, if you have been exposed to uh, emergency management in the last several years, you will have heard the term whole community. You may have heard the term inclusive whole community. Definitionally, um, according to Homeland Security and FEMA, 
Whole community has a definition. Next slide. Whole community inclusion is a process through which community leaders, emergency management personnel, community organizations, businesses, and all residents, and the highlight there is all residents, can identify and assess their needs and assets of their respective communities before a disaster occurs. You're going to, if you haven't already, heard of redundancy in what I'm talking about. When we are looking to these guidance documents and all of this systems that make up the jurisdictions and the public agencies approach to community and approach to planning for a community, there is always that component of the individual participant. Next slide. Whole community principles are broken down into strategies and they begin with understanding the community, move on to identifying community cultures, building relationships and partnerships within that culture in a culturally competent manner, communicating and engaging with the natural community as it is, identifying in that community and engagement what works well on a daily basis, what can be replicated to ensure community resilience in a disaster response. And then using that information to see what can we leverage, what assets exist within the natural community that can be implemented um, to best meet the community's needs. And finally, the last strategy is how do we identify assets, resources, individuals, agencies within the community and empower them to be active partners, not just having a seat at the table, so to speak, but actually having a contributory participation um, in the event. We talked at the beginning, new slide, about some of the things that we identified as learning opportunities and challenges. We now are gonna talk about a couple examples of how community, whole community strategies were applied during some of the recent disasters. Next slide. Um, there were some, some community assets and resources that were effectively leveraged in 2017, 2018, there were, there were actually many, but a few of them that I'm going to identify for you today include the Trick Mamas from Louisiana, who initially were two mothers of children who had tracheotomies. They became a very viable participant, active resource uh, for some of the more recent floods that affected Louisiana and Texas in providing consumable medical supplies. They partnered with, the, uh, with some of the other volunteer agencies and were extremely effective getting consumable medical supplies out. During Hurricane Irma, Portlight and the Pass It On Center provided durable medical equipment to Puerto Rico in times that the formal public agency processes could not facilitate it in a timely manner. Um, Samaritan's Purse, another NGO, provided consumable medical supplies into the mountains of Puerto Rico, again, long before the public agencies were able to facilitate doing that. During Hurricane Harvey, the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies created and set up a hotline that served thousands of individuals, I believe 3,200 3, individuals who had a disability but were in some manner, for whatever reason, disenfranchised from the system of support and were not able to navigate that. So they reached out to the hotline. During Hurricane Matthew, there were many disability advisor accommodation advice, disability advocacy accommodation advisors who were deployed to various places to provide disability and access and functional needs support and technical assistance. These, some of these advisors came from um, both formal and informal uh, agencies. Now, we've talked a lot about what are the roles and responsibilities and what are the expectations for inclusive planning from the jurisdictions. Let's talk a little bit about how that relates to personal preparedness because that's really what we're here to talk about today. You will have seen as we go through that personal preparedness concepts are embedded into everything that is written in terms of um, 
Emergency Management Guidance for Planning and Response. So how does that transition to whole community planning? What is the role of personal preparedness when we're talking about inclusive whole community planning? We will discover that when we see what inclusive whole community planning's purpose is. It is to engage the full capacity of the private and nonprofit sectors, including businesses, faith-based and disability organizations, as well as the general public, in conjunction with the participation of local, tribal, state, territorial, federal government partners. Second purpose of whole, inclusive whole community planning is to build a system that encourages individuals, families, communities, and states, as well as the private sector, to participate in building resiliency and capacity. So you'll see the whole community planning is really based on participation from essentially the whole community. When we say community-based organizations, we are really talking about organizations who serve disability populations and others in st steady state day-to-day -day basis. When these organizations were um, surveyed about their ability to decipher and engage and connect with the Emergency Management Committee, our community, they had a response that 85.7% of them reported they did not know how to link up effectively with the emergency management system. So we had a big, huge gap between what was happening on a daily basis and what individuals had the capacity to do and how did they properly and appropriately get involved. Well, when we looked at that, it begins, it began in an analysis, we realized that that begins at an individual level with personal preparedness for everyone. We tend to think that if there's a disaster, the local, state, and federal emergency managers and their first responders are going to be the people leading the charge. When in reality, the charge begins with each person. And the way that the emergency management system is set up is the assumption that each person will participate in their own personal preparedness. Each person and then their natural supports, their family and friends, and that builds to the local communities and local response and then the government agencies. So you'll see what I'm describing is really a paradigm shift. It is a change from what the way we used to think about things to the way we really need to think about things moving forward in order to be effective for all individuals in the community, including those people who have a disability. Um, next slide. In that paradigm shift, we are acknowledging that the first responder community cannot independently identify and meet the needs of the whole community. The first image that you see on this slide is of one person at the bottom of an inverted pyramid trying to support everybody else. Now, this is impressive and successful when done by some tumbling teams, but not really a good emergency management and response strategy. We realized through all these lessons learned that we need to apply information that's gathered from shared community stakeholders and then empower those community stakeholders to share that information with each other. So in the second image that you see on this slide, we really have created a network of participants, beginning with the individual person and then their natural supports, their formal supports, and the other people that those supports interact with, building to a more integrated, more foundationally strong strategy that begins and doesn't end with the individual person. And in our case, for our conversation, it begins with the person who has a disability. This is how we participate in building resiliency and ownership for personal preparedness in all of our efforts. In order for individuals to be personally prepared, the first steps um, begin with personal preparedness thoughts. Individuals are already experts in their own needs. In addition to that expertise, what do they need? When we looked at that question, we discovered that individuals need access to accurate information. They need training and education. 
they need support and appropriate tools, and then they need the ability to become personally prepared. Personal prepared thought process includes kits, personal individual kits, as well as household kits, plans on what they're going to do, what are the action steps they're going to employ, and it includes connections and contact. Who are the natural support? Who are the real true first responders? If you have a disaster, who is going to be your first responder? Who will conceivably and most probably be there before an official uniformed first responder? Those efforts involve assessing personal needs and household needs, and then evaluating what's required to meet those needs. And it moves into the natural environment. What are the pieces and people that need to be a part of the plan? And for individuals with a disability, it might include their community group, their recreation group, possibly a day program. It might include children or grandchildren, parents or grandparents. It might also include service providers. There's a lot of people that essentially become involved when any individual begins to think about their own personal preparedness. Personal preparedness outcomes, however, are well worth the effort. When a person becomes personally prepared, they, they go through an education in the hazards and response systems of risks that might involve them community networks that they may have that they haven't really strategically thought about before. It also involves a process of self-discovery, an evaluation of what are my needs on a daily basis. If I was to be in a shelter tonight, what are some of the things that I need to maintain my usual level of independence and capabilities? It involves individual and personalized approach. There is no cookie cutter strategy for personal preparedness. Not everyone is the same, and so consequently, not all of our needs and assets are going to be the same. It involves following simple strategies that can be implemented and integrated into daily life. The last thing that we rarely think about is that it can actually be fun and empowering. Personal preparedness and people with disabilities is a, a topic without or with some potential pitfalls. So how do we avoid those pitfalls? And the first step is to identify what they are. There have been studies done on individuals with a disability related to disasters. It's discovered that they are less likely to have an accurate perception of their own preparedness. They are less likely to have taken steps towards preparedness. And they're less likely to leave their home if instructed to do so in, a, in an impending or current disaster. Looking a little bit more deeply into some of the research, we will look at um, individuals with a disability and their perception of preparedness. And the graph that you see compares a person with a disability with someone from a general population survey on whether they feel prepared or whether they feel capable of becoming personally prepared. Uh, for your edification, the general population responses were from a national survey conducted by the Red Cross. The person with a disability survey information was from a disability-based research study on, on, from the Center on Disability Studies at the University of Hawaii. Keep in mind, the individuals with a disability study was done exclusively with individuals who had exposure to personal preparedness. So they understood what was, what was asked about when we use the term personal preparedness. And you'll see that although many people felt prepared, greater percentage of people with a disability did not feel capable of ex executing their own personal preparedness. Moving on to the next slide, we'll see other survey results related to personal preparedness, comparing persons without a disability to persons with a disability, and we'll see that in all cases, persons with a disability felt unable to prepare, overwhelmed by the concept of personal preparedness, and some overwhelmed to the point that they didn't really want to think about it. Others, and a 
great proportion, the largest number of people with a disability didn't feel, feel they need to become personally prepared because someone else would help them. And majority of the time, that someone else was an emergency responder. So we'll see that there's a huge gap between what the jurisdictions are planning to execute and what they're capable of executing and what an individual with a disability may perceive they have a need for. On the next slide, you'll see same studies that address information and communication for individuals with a disability in the event of a disaster. 10% expected that their case manager, their service provider, or some other individual that they interact with on a daily basis, a regular basis, would provide them information in a disability. What we know is that in many cases for public agency representatives, uh, participants from Department of Health and Human Services or Department of Health um, are part of the emergency response plan. So they are not going to be reaching out to their typical constituents and um, individuals, they're going to be tasked in a different way. So that 10% had a very errant expectation. 17% planned to call a case manager or a service provider in response to an emergency. We know those people will not necessarily be available to address the issue on an individual case-by-case -case basis. And 36% of the individuals surveyed, surveyed expected that a person or another professional of some kind would assist them in an emergency. So again, we see a huge gap in expectations and the capacity of the system to assist individuals. On the next slide, we see the ability to evacuate or self-perceived ability to evacuate of individuals who were surveyed who had a disability. We see 79% of the respondents may not evacuate if they were advised to do so. Several reasons for that, the biggest reasons being that they would need help or they perceived they would need help or they didn't know where to go or how to get there. Additional significant reasons in their responses for not evacuating included the perception that they would be safe in their home, that evacuating would pose a higher safety risk than remaining in their home and utilizing their existing resources. So some of these issues we have seen have some validity that these are valid concerns. However, we also know that just simply deciding not to evacuate is often not the safest route. In this last slide of our survey results, we see for those who do evacuate and go to a shelter, the divergent expectations and needs of an individual who would arrive at a shelter, what they think they're going to expect and what they think is going to be, I'm sorry, what they think they're going to need and what they expect to be provided. Notice that almost 20% of the individuals surveyed will need and expect mental, medical help. Almost 40% will need medication, and almost 30% have expectations that there will be a personal assistant in the shelter that would be available for them. We all know that these expectations are not um, what we typically see in a general population shelter and most of the time, not in a medical shelter either. So the findings, these, these findings were reinforced on a local level um, very recently after Hurricane Harvey through the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley um, program, where they replicated almost all of the exact same outcomes. Some of the individuals with a disability did not believe a disaster would occur or affect them, even though the Rio Grande Valley is an area that does repetitively um, experience natural disasters. Majority of the individuals with the disability who were surveyed in this study had not prepared and did not have plans to prepare. A significant number would not evacuate and their reasons were very similar to the previous study. They did not know where to go. 
they had concerns about their personal property and its safety, and they had concerns about their resources, their durable medical equipment, their personal and shelter environment. They had concerns about the inability to evacuate due to transportation or financial reasons. So we see there's a fairly significant chasm between what individuals with a disability perceive to be the case and the role of emergency managers and what emergency managers are really capable of doing. How do we bridge that chasm? By addressing some of these perceptions as well as the perception of what it means to become personally prepared. So let's look at some of the planning considerations for individuals with a disability. Next slide. Planning considerations include, can we have the next slide please? Thank you, there we go. Include concerns about time. Personal preparedness is not an inoculation. Personal preparedness is a process. Concerns about money, that preparedness planning must be funding based, that I must have the, an adequate amount of financial resources to become personally prepared. Another consideration and hang up is that there is a, that I don't know enough or I'm not capable of personal preparedness. Planning comes from personal experience and expertise. So let's look very briefly at these considerations. Consideration of time. Preparedness is not a specified time and place where we take on a large task. Next slide, please. And decide this weekend or this week or this month, I'm going to become personally prepared. If we look at it that way, it can be a very daunting and overwhelming concept. Rather, personal preparedness should be a framework or a way of thinking to ensure that our needs are met. It is incorporating the thought process into our daily planning activities, just as we would if we see it raining very heavily um, outside, we may want to take a rain jacket or an umbrella or some rubber boots. This is a very simple, overly simplified example of personal preparedness as a way of thinking. It's a thought process that we integrate into our daily lives and use what we experience on a daily basis to help us prepare for the larger, more significant events. For individuals who have specific needs and those who have chronic conditions, those who take medications or those who rely on others for any part of their daily tasks, those who have transportation needs or live independently, personal preparedness is even more important. We need to include currently making time into the daily schedule for thoughts or activities of personal preparedness. That doesn't think is not exclusive to just identifying what our needs are, but on a daily basis, acknowledging what are our capacities, how do I problem solve on a, on a small scale that I can think about applying to my larger scale. When it comes to the issue of money, we need to look at an asset-based approach rather than a purchase-based approach. Personal preparedness can be completed on any budget. In fact, one of the more successful trainings and well-attended trainings that we provide is called personal preparedness on a dollar. Purchasing a can of tuna each week in addition to your groceries is a better preparedness approach than buying a prefab kit. Why? Because per when you're purchasing a little bit each time, that's integrated into your daily activities. It also means that the, the kit you build over time is applicable to your specific needs. It also means it can be completed on any budget. And it means that it is an ongoing thought process. So it helps you build an awareness of personal needs, including things that you as an individual will actively need. No one else will have the exact same kit that I have because nobody else will have the exact same needs I have. Following this chain of thought, we really, begin with knowledge. What are my needs? What are my assets? How do I experience planning on a daily basis? When we take this approach, it becomes an empowerment-based thought process rather than a fear-based process. 
Oftentimes we find individuals and emergency managers a little bit resistant or reticent about sharing about disasters with individuals because we don't want to scare people. However, fear does not have to be a part of the process at all if we integrate education and knowledge. Then we have individuals identifying what are my skill sets and how do I identify those. Those types of thoughts cannot coexist with fear-based thinking. However, when we do utilize an empowerment-based approach, it drives people into action rather than driving them into inertia. And we'll see some examples of this as we go along. So what are the benefits besides what I've already inferred uh, that to personal preparedness? It is essential to preservation of life and property. Each individual knows and assesses what are their priorities, what is important to them, and they're able to take steps to ensure their safety. It minimizes loss, damage, and stress. It increases community resiliency as each individual becomes empowered to be prepared. It creates personal empowerment that impacts every facet of life. And it creates and identifies community capacity and networks that may have gone unnoticed before. Those networks and that capacity become force multipliers as the ripple effect goes into play in the natural community. And it prepares people to engage in a whole community planning together with individuals from the emergency management field, creating, in some cases, some very unexpected leaders. We're going to talk right now for the last few minutes about an example of personal preparedness and how this has been observed to roll out, um, creating some, some very atypical emergency management and emergency preparedness leaders. So the example I'm going to highlight is a program called Feeling Safe, Being Safe. The core of this program was developed initially in California by their Consumer Advisory Council, a group of self-advocates and their Department of Homeland Security, together with the Department of Human Services. They created what they called and labeled feeling safe, being safe materials. This was an emergency preparedness training designed by individuals with a disability to be implemented for individuals with a disability. Several states have found these materials useful and are utilizing them in some fashion as it makes its way or has made its way across the country. Minnesota and Pennsylvania, for example, are using the materials exactly as they were developed by California. Oregon and Washington use the materials as a model to create their own preparedness tools. And Hawaii utilized the original materials and employed local self-advocates to create a training network curriculum um, to supplement what was created in California. The Feeling Safe, Being Safe program overview, and I'm sorry, as a point of information, moving forward, this Feeling Safe, Being Safe program is not the original, it is the one that was augmented by the Center for Disabilities in uh, the University of Hawaii. So these are Hawaii Feeling Safe, Being Safe program individuals. The Feeling Safe program overview, as I mentioned, includes individuals with a disability to become personally prepared. Those individuals take the lead to help others become prepared and become force multipliers for personal preparedness. It utilizes a lead by example model and personal, prepared, personal empowerment teaching techniques. Individuals with a disability following this program become recognized subject matter experts within their natural community and become peer and community resources rather than recipients of care. The experience of participating in this program uh, follows a certain, ex certain set of steps. There are video modules that an individual will watch. They are trained in the think, plan, do process, which means for everything that you're going to do, you think about it, you create a plan, and then you execute that plan for yourself. It is based on repetition, practice, and personalization. It is addressing problem solving, and it is identifying support people who occur in the natural environment. It also integrates a system of follow-up, 
like I mentioned previously, this is personal preparedness is not an inoculation. And any given step could create a potential barrier for an individual. So it integrates a system where people become enmeshed and empowered by their peers. The feeling safe being safe training topics include a curriculum that addresses planning for personal preparedness, response and recovery, action steps, and building their natural community supports, as well as evacuation and sheltering decisions for themselves. The materials, the core materials, include a worksheet to help the, with the think, plan, do process that you see on the left of the screen, a magnet that's utilized in the home for personal emergencies, or if a first responder is dispatched to the home to assist in evacuation or for other reasons, a personal preparedness kit, and a, a strategy to identify and or build your own personal first responder. And in many cases, that is your geographic neighbor. In other cases, it is other personal and natural supports. The worksheet. The worksheet, as I mentioned, assists the individual to walk through the steps of thinking about what their needs are and what are the assets that they utilize on a daily basis, planning on how to, how to utilize those assets to meet their needs in a disaster, and doing what needs to be done to put those pieces in place. It assists the individual to create their kit and complete their preparedness steps, and it provides critical information to first responders and shelter staff and others. So the worksheet really is the template that is used throughout the process from beginning through to the end and ultimately is taken by the individual when they evacuate as part of their kit. It contains all of the personal information they would need if they arrive at a shelter and need to share with an individual to register. The magnet, as I mentioned, is used for the individual for their, in, for their contact and resource information and for first responders when dispatched to respond to their home and assist in an evacuation. It includes personal information, their emergency kit information, any accommodations they might need, and resource and contact information. Typically, it, on the back is adhered medication information. Um, the medication information was not implemented in the front of the magnet so as to maintain that confidentiality um, when an individual is, is in their daily life and having people over to their homes, etc. Also for safety reasons. The kit, part three of the process, is provides an individual with the essential items for a three to five day evacuation in a general population shelter. The evacuation supplies are really focused on what are the needs of that individual person. Do they need uh, spare hearing aid batteries? Do they need a source of emotional support? Um, what do they do on a daily basis to provide for their needs that can be utilized in a general population shelter and putting those things together for that individual? And to be clear, this kit is not a household or a family planning kit. This is particular to each individual person and kept on a daily basis where it makes sense for that individual person to retrieve them in an evacuation. The neighbor is a significant part of the planning process. The purpose for having the neighbor contact is to assist the individual to meet and exchange information with another person in close geographic proximity to build a natural support and create a natural first responder. It includes ideas and instructions on how to, how to meet and a process for exchanging information. One piece of that goes to each person. The whole experience um, for the individual with a disability participating in feeling safe, being safe process, is summarized in several steps. They take the training. They go do their homework and apply the strategies to their own life. They experience follow-up from their trainer, and then they practice what they know, and they share with somebody else. 
Most importantly, it is founded on the concept of personal responsibility. Each individual person takes personal responsibility for their own preparedness and response plans. Uh, what you're seeing on your screen is an example of a feeling safe, being safe trainer, together with a group of individuals who have just completed their face-to-face -face training and will now go back home to complete their magnet, their kit, their worksheet, and connect with their neighbors. Some of those individuals who do become personally prepared go on to become feeling safe, being safe trainers. They are interested in, they are interested self-advocates who have the ability and have expressed an interest in taking on leadership. Those individuals plan with a mentor coach of their choice to begin to learn not just how to be personally prepared, but how to conduct and present a training and become a certified host community trainer. The process of going from being personally prepared to becoming a force multiplier advocate certified trainer is a fairly simple one. They complete their own steps of personal preparedness, their worksheet, their magnet, their kit, and their neighbor. And then they are equipped with training manuals, materials, and toolkit on how to share that information with others how to set up and reach out to their natural community, how to conduct a training, everything from how do you dress, and it might be different than when you go do other things, to how to speak to a group, as well as the core information on sharing the curriculum. They then go on to learn how to identify other potential leaders in the classes that they have so you can see the whole process is built on building leaders, building individuals to grow from, I think I might need to take a preparedness class, to becoming individuals in their community who are leaders on this subject. It's about emergency preparedness and whole community planning. So individuals who, with a disability, who become emergency preparedness trainers, actually become part of that whole community planning process. They still are experts in their own, dis their own disability and their own needs, but they're also experts on how to empower others, how to take on new responsibilities in the community, how to present and teach others the information that they need to, to know. We go from there to what I've labeled extreme empowerment. Of those people who are trainers. They're personally prepared and then they become certified trainers. Some of them go on to become mentor coach trainer specialists. Those individuals take on the role of facilitating and assisting other trainers to grow in their role, particularly when someone is a new trainer, newly certified trainer. That can be a very scary transition if you've never had that opportunity before. So they are paired up with other individuals who have gone through the process and have now learned facilitating and support strategies to help others. They train first responder groups on the use of the tools and they are uh, force multipliers for all of the training and future training candidates. The spontaneous emergence of the mentor coach specialist is a component that happened not out of a plan or a strategy, but because individuals who went through this process felt they had developed needs and the abilities, the abilities and capacity to take that next step to extreme empowerment. So they were individuals with a disability assisting other individuals with a disability trainers to train other individuals with a disability on emergency personal preparedness. This changed the role of the individual with respect to their peers, with respect to service providers, and with respect to emergency responders and managers. When we look at the changing role of the individual with a disability, individuals began to see themselves as capable of taking steps to preparedness, they saw themselves as someone who was val had valuable information to share with service providers, as someone who could impact their community and their community members, professionals, 
and reevaluate the individual's ability to contribute to the planning process. So as these people went out into their community, into their local firehouse, and to their local Red Cross agents, and to um, participate in exercises, they took advantage of the opportunity to share with service providers and emergency managers information that was essential on assisting individuals with a disability. This changes the impact on the community. Individuals went far and wide um, sharing their information. What you see on the screen is one of the Feeling Safe, Being Safe trainers from the first two years of the program after her presentation at a National Emergency Management Conference. Um, and in the center, you'll see that is a former FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate. What we saw happening with this program was a paradigm shift occurring for individuals to begin to be seen as an asset with subject matter expertise to contribute to their community capacity rather than potential recipients of care and users of resources. The impact on the community when this happened was when we combined individuals with a disability with the tools and curriculum to empower them and engage the appropriate agencies to support them, they had a significant impact not only on their personal preparedness, but on the whole community strategy of the public sector to create resilient communities. I mentioned engaging agencies to support them. This doesn't begin in a vacuum. There has to be a few agencies that get it, that believe in personal empowerment and can identify people that may be good candidates for the emergency preparedness program present that opportunity to potentially interested individuals and support those who choose to participate by hosting initial trainings to allow them the opportunity. More difficult for the typical agency beyond those steps was the ability to willingly act as a facilitator and allow individuals with a disability to own their own preparedness inclusive of the errors that happen along the way as we all develop our unique kits and to be open to changes. In the last few moments, I wanted to share with you um, some of the things that happen when we, execute, um, when we executed this training. Feeling safe being safe trainers typically did not stop with being personally prepared and sharing with others. Many of them went on to do other things involved in the whole community strategy. They became Red Cross certified volunteers, CERT certified volunteers, trainers recruiting individuals who were deaf, others individuals who were blind, trainers that for local fire department and local emergency managers. They became trainers for their local churches, um, presenters at national conferences, one of them became a White House Youth Preparedness State Representative, and um, one of them ended up as a presenter for the FEMA administration. They literally went all the way to DC with their knowledge and their subject matter expertise. Highlighting one of our trainers um, with her permissions because she presented on what her experiences as a trainer were. Um, and I will very briefly summarize um, what, what she said, these are her words, uh, not mine, and I thank Bathy for allowing me to share her experiences with you. Um, she capsuled her experience by identifying her life before, where she couldn't speak up for herself. Well, I will use her words. She said, I couldn't speak up for myself. I saw myself as a client. I didn't know that I could do a lot of things. I didn't know that I could help others. What she said she did. I took an emergency preparedness class, learned how to be prepared as a trainer, trained others to be prepared, traveled to other places to train people. What do I do now? Bathy uh, began the, this process about six, five years ago, and now she says she helps other people become trainers, host a booth at preparedness fairs, speak at conferences, participate in statewide exercises, and work with the local state ADA coordinator. Questioning, answering the question, how what I did changed my life, Bathy's answer was, I was shy, but I worked on my confidence. 
I learned how to speak up for myself, ask people to listen to me, learn to share my feelings, learned how not to be scared and to ask for help. Bathy's message of who she is today. I am the president for the Hawaii Self-Advocacy Advisory Council. I'm a business owner and training people about emergency preparedness. I help people with disabilities have a voice and make their own decisions. I dream of living on my own and having my own family and helping people reach their goals and dreams. Her message for others with a disability, you need to have respect for yourself, be confident, use your voice to speak up for yourself, make your own choices, learn from your mistakes and be okay. Build relationships and choices, and I'm sorry, build relationships and choose the people in your circle of support and be prepared for an emergency. Why does the Feeling Safe Being Safe program work? It works because each piece person is responsible for their own preparedness. Each trainer has their own support structure. Each trainer can increase their involvement as res and responsibility as they're ready. And each individual has the opportunity to become involved in their community with their local emergency management community. So as you see, the Feeling Safe Being Safe really enables the individual with a disability to en empower the local jurisdiction to actually apply whole community principles. So the local jurisdiction success is based on and necessitates our personal preparedness. Those whole community principles that are enabled through the process are understanding and meeting the actual needs of the whole community engaging and empowering all parts of the community and strengthening what works well in communities on a daily basis. Feeling Safe Being Safe does this on an individual level so that the jurisdiction can do this on a more global level. It is an example of a paradigm shift from the traditional model of service to a grassroots model of whole community approach. It's based in the principles of empowerment applicable to a diverse culture, embedded in the community structure, it's simple and sustainable. It's a two-way communication model that is inclusive and it's a 360 degree training principle model. And it applies a cooperative collaborative partnership. In conclusion, embracing change and equipping individuals with a disability to be prepared and resilient empowers the individual, transforms the culture of the community and increases the capacity of the whole community. And that is the end of my slide. I successfully used up most of your um, question and answer time, but um, I am going to open it up to any questions at this time and remain available if you want to use the information on that final slide um, to reach out to me at any time with additional or individual questions. Thank you very much, Tony. So go ahead and post your questions in the Q&A box and we'll give it here just a few seconds and see if we have any questions come up. We didn't during the session, so uh, that doesn't mean people don't wait until the end, so. We do have a thank you. <laughs> well, it's been my pleasure being here today for sure. Um, Lydia asks, how can we access the training program to educate individuals with disabilities or how to be a trainer? Lydia, um, there are a variety of ways that you can become more familiar with the Feeling Safe Being Safe program. Those core preliminary materials that were developed um, by California uh, self-advocates are available on the California Disabilities uh, Developmental Disabilities Council website. Um, if the simplest way, I'm a Google person, um, and so the simplest way is if you Google feeling safe, being safe, um, they are the first links that will show up. They have electronic versions of all of the original materials that you can access uh, free of charge. Additionally, as I mentioned, many states and jurisdictions and some individual uh, agencies have utilized these materials to adapt them um, and, and modify them a little bit to meet their needs in the best, most effective way. I am um, very available for you if you want to utilize the information on your screen to find additional ways and strategies to utilize those materials or other ideas of how those might be 
used most effectively for the population group that you would like to reach out to. So um, those core materials can be accessed online. Um, and, and as you can tell, I have a, a fairly significant passion um, for some of the capacity that we've seen in this program, and I'm very happy to facilitate you uh, in any way that I can help. Well, thank you, Dawn. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. So everyone, again, take a note here of Dawn's email address and contact information. And like she said, she's willing to help you facilitate um, getting these things, getting the ball rolling in your community. Uh, she, we do have another question from Lydia. Do you know of any Texas agencies that have modified these materials? You would be the first, I believe, Lydia. Um, so <laughs> go for it. Yes, go for it. Go for it. Well, um, lots of thank yous coming up in the um, uh, Q&A box. So thank you so much, John, for joining us today. Uh, have a great afternoon, as well as everyone else. Thank you for participating today. We will send the training materials to you within the next couple of weeks. Have a great day, and thank you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.